Your blood has made a way Worthy is your name Worthy is your name Jesus Your blood has made a way Worthy is your name We can say the name
Imagine Paul and Silas in a prison singing praises, not knowing when freedom was going to happen, not knowing when breakthrough. They just knew that he's coming, he's coming. He's coming, he's coming. Holy, holy, holy. It's the Switch the lyric and say healer. Let's say healer, healer, healer. It's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He's coming as a healer. Say healer, healer, healer. It's the Say Savior, Savior, He's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He's coming as a Savior, 
Can we be selfless for a couple minutes? I really feel in the spirit that tonight is going to be a catalyst in this moment, like even now, for our generation to start realizing who they are. See, it's easy, it's easy for us to point the finger and be like, or like, don't you know that you're a child of God? When, when people have lived their lives as other, sometimes it's hard for them to realize, hey, I'm really not that. So I feel like the Lord is in this moment, especially for this generation, using this environment to cause a revival of identity in, in the sons and daughters of God. So for a couple minutes, a couple seconds, maybe for 60 seconds, if we can be selfless and do you realize, I know you do, but let me remind you that when Paul and Silas started singing Jesus, they weren't the only ones who got free. So I'm trying to tell you that your worship is not just breaking chains in here. You're breaking generational curses tonight. So I know y'all a whole bunch of praying people. So for the next 60 seconds, whether you pray in English or in the spirit, come on, let's charge heaven on behalf of this generation. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for this generation. We pray for sons and daughters to be awakened to who they are in you. We pray for the sons and daughters to see Jesus Christ high and lifted in their hearts in the name of Jesus so that they will see the one who loves them, so that they will see the one who holds them, so that they will see the one who saved them, delivered them, Father, let them not live out of an old creature. Let them not live in an old nature. Behold, you have made them a new creature. And we declare by the power of Jesus that every chain of identity crisis, every chain of homosexuality, every chain of lesbianism, every chain of depression, every chain is being broken in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. If you believe it, would you shout in this room? Come on. Holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is. Holy, holy, holy It's the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come He's breaking the chains now The prison doors are opening now Right now, right now, right now, right now Right now, right now, right now Chains of addiction, he's breaking He's breaking now, he's breaking now Chains of depression, he's breaking now He's breaking now, he's breaking now He's breaking, he's breaking Every chain, he's breaking Every chain
and told God loves you but what does that really mean that some impersonal force galaxies away may consider you from time to time or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it there are billions of lives billions of stories can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are His child, created in His image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, He's carefully constructing the events of your life to build His kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you.
are uh, finishing up this three-part series. Um, he's still got the whole world in his hands, and I'd like to begin today by teaching you a verse um, from Psalm, Psalm 33, 22, and uh, I want you to say it with me, and if you're not used to talking in church, um, then you haven't been going to one of our churches, because we talk in church. I, I grew up in a church like many of you, and times change, so this isn't meant to be critical. It's just times change where you weren't supposed to talk in church or run in the halls. That's the, sort of like the number one rule. I was sure it was the 11th commandment, don't run in the halls. And the reason was really strange because this is God's house. And I thought, oh, he lives here, all these bathrooms and no bedrooms. It's just so odd. But anyway, <laughs> that was my eight-year-old mind trying to understand how this was God's house. And he has houses everywhere, I discovered. And then I was told I was his house. And so anyway, it get confusing. Okay, so... <laughs> Anyway, so I, I want to teach you this verse, and it goes like this. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. We're going to put this up on the screen. I want you to read it with me. Ready? All together. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Okay, that was kind of your church voice, all right? This time with a little bit of enthusiasm. Here we go. May your Good, good. All right, let's take it off the screen and see how we're doing. I'll say it, and you can come mumble along with me. Ready? I, I just let's repeat after me first. Ready? May your unfailing love be with us, Lord. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord. Even as we put our hope in you. Amen. Good. All right, all together without any props. Ready? Together. It's good. Be with us, Lord. I want to talk a little bit today about hope. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about a tension that all of us have faced, are facing, or will facing as it relates to hope. And it's, it's the tension of trying to maintain hope in what seems at times to be an, uh, uh, you know, a hopelessly broken world. How do you maintain hope in a world that at times seems hopelessly broken? Now, let me kind of throw out some scenarios because it, it just makes sure we're all thinking along the same lines. If you have ever placed your hope in something or someone, and that something come crashing down, or that someone leave you, then you understand this tension. How do you maintain hope in a world that seems at times to be hopelessly broken? Um, if you stood at an altar and said, you know, until death do us part, and then he or she decided it wasn't going to be until death, it was going to be until somebody else came along, and your marriage came crashing down around you, and you felt that sense of helplessness and hopelessness, you understand what it means to try to manage this tension of how do you maintain hope and love? How do you try to maintain hope in people? How do you try to maintain hope in relationships in what seems to be a hopelessly broken world? If you were promised something at work, and you did your part, in fact, you went the second mile, and someone didn't come through for you, and your hopes were in that job, that advancement, that opportunity, that move, that whatever it might be, and you'd found yourself with this sense of despair, and you think, you know, why even try? You know what it means to face that kind of, that, that tension, to manage the tension of how do I maintain hope in what at times seems to be a hopelessly broken world? Um, you, you, had, you had extremely, you know, unusual athletic ability, and your, all your hopes and dreams were on your ability to compete, and maybe it was a scholarship, maybe even somebody said, you know, you may be a professional athlete in whatever your field was, and then you were injured or something happened to you, or you lost a scholarship, or something beyond your control, and you found yourself with a sense of hopelessness, and you're, you're managing that tension of how do I maintain hope in what seems to be, in your case, a hopelessly broken world. I mean, you had aspirations for your son or your daughter, and they got hooked up with the wrong group, and they are everything other than what you had hoped for them, and you can't go back and give them back their teenage years, you can't go back and give them that first year in college, and you look at them and, and you just think, it just seems hopeless. You're managing that tension of how do you maintain hope in what seems to be a hopelessly broken world. If you have not found yourself managing this tension yet, just get ready because it's coming. Aren't you glad you came to church today for this encouraging message? Okay, um, but if you've ever found yourself saying, why try? Why even go on? Well, why study? Well, why apply myself? Well, why even show up? Why, why, why? If you've ever said out loud or in your heart, what's the point? What's the point of loving when people treat you that way? What's the point of committing when people's commitment don't mean anything? What's the point of investing years in a company when the company doesn't seem to want to invest any time or any years in you? I mean, if you've ever found yourself saying, what's the point, what's the use? You have bumped into the inevitable question that everybody will ask. How do you maintain hope? Why maintain hope in a world that seems to be hopelessly broken? That's why I want to talk a little bit about hope. Now, 
As we launch into this discussion, I want to kind of give you a working definition of hope. And this is sort of a culmination of several different definitions I stole from different people. But essentially, a working definition is essentially hope is the person or thing, the person or thing in which your expectations are centered. The person or persons or thing or things in which your expectations for the future or your expectations are centered. These are the things you are leaning into. These are the things that as you look into the future, your hope is in that. Your hope is in that relationship. Your hope is in that group of relationships. Your hope is in that company. Your hope is in this profession. Your hope is in your ability. Your hope is in your looks. Your hope is you have centered your expectations in something. Hope is a little bit like a ladder that we lean against a wall. And the interesting thing is, none of us ever remember doing this. None of us are ever conscious of this process. But when you were born, you automatically lean the ladder of hope into your parents or into your mom. That your hope for your future had everything to do with your parents' willingness or ability to care for you. It wasn't a conscious decision. Then as you got older, you began to move your ladder. And you moved it from someone else's commitment to you to perhaps your ability to take care of yourself, your ability to connect, your ability to get a scholarship, to do well in school, your ability to maintain relationships, your ability to attract attention, your ability to marry somebody that had promise, um, family money, whatever it might be. But all of us from time to time at different stages of life, we make a decision to lean the ladder of hope onto something that we think will support our ambition or support our aspirations or our hopes and dreams for the future. And we're never aware of this. But when you walked in today, or as you sat down to listen, or if you're listen, you know, watching online, or you stuck in a CD, but even as you do that, you have placed your hopes in something. Your ladder is leaning against a wall somewhere. But because we're unaware of it, we go through life unaware of what we're hoping for, and the only time we ever think about hope is when we begin to feel hopeless. And the sense of hopelessness and despair, or helplessness is another word, is simply that feeling that the thing I have leaned my ladder against isn't coming through for me. It's that thing that I've centered my expectations in, and it's not meeting up to my expectations. It's not going to happen for me. We're not going to have children when we thought we would have children. I'm going to be 30, and I'm, I'm still going to be single. I'm not going to be able to retire when I thought I would be able to retire. Nobody's calling. Nobody's answering the phone. It's only when the thing that we've leaned our ladder against doesn't come through for us that we begin to experience and think about the whole subject of hope. Otherwise, we just go day to day to day with our ladder leaning somewhere and we're totally unaware. It's only when we begin to experience the free fall. It's only when we bump up against this tension of how do I remain hopeful? How do I go on? How do I keep trying? Why do I keep investing? It's only then that we realize that perhaps we've leaned our ladder up against something that's not as secure as we thought it should be. All of you today, all of us today, we have a ladder of hope, and it's leaning up against something. And the question is, how do you maintain hope? in a world that if you have not discovered it yet, you will discover it eventually, is in fact hopelessly broken. Now, when you open the Bible, and, and this is such preacher talk, and this isn't going to take you by surprise, when you open the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we are instructed to place our hope in God. To put our hope in God, to lean our ladder against God who's invited us to call him Father, and to lean our ladder of hope, of, for all hope, into our relationship with him. And so the verse that we memorized a few minutes ago, you know, your unfa may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as, even as we put our hope, that is, move my ladder, place my ladder, lean my ladder against you. If you were here um, back in the, the last couple of falls when we've done our Be Rich campaign, one of the key verses said this. It, Paul was talking, Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament was talking to a young guy and he, named Timothy. And he said, Timothy, tell those rich people the following. He says, tell those rich people not to put their hope in riches because they are so uncertain. To which we in our current economy say, Amen, or right on, or yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly right. He says, tell them, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but 
put, tell them to put their hope in the Lord. That is, to move their ladder from the wall of if I save enough and I work hard enough and if I jump high enough and if I follow through enough, that somehow it's all going to work out for me. Paul says, tell even the wealthy, successful people, be careful. Don't lean your ladder there. Lean your ladder against the Lord. Now, of course you would expect the preacher to say that. And of course you would expect the Bible to say that. But even if, you're, if you've been a Christian a long time, perhaps you believed in God your whole life, maybe you're new to this, all of us, especially in the United States of America, we have a real hard time with the idea of putting our hope in the Lord, or putting our hope in God. And the reason we do is because we are the best in the world at creating walls that hold up pretty good. Because we believe, and have been told, and understandably so, we believe if we have the right education, this ladder's going to hold. And if you're good looking enough, this ladder's going to hold. And if you have the right surgery, and you have the right connections, and you marry well, and you save well, and you're disciplined, and you stay away from drugs, and you just say no, and all the, you know, all the themes, and all the sayings, and all the billboards, and all the stuff, if you do all of that right, and if you're really careful, and you're really slick, and you're really connected, and you do it all right, that there certainly is something in this world that you can lean your hope up against that's going to hold. And so we do everything in our power to put our hope in things that we control, things that we create, things that we manufacture, things that we've been told we should place our hope in, in hopes that the latter will hold. And then if you're a Christian, you just for good luck say, dear God, please don't let my ladder fall. God, please help this company, help it to go public. Heavenly Father, please give me wisdom as I spin the dial and try to figure out where to invest money. God, please help her to call me back. God, I think I have found a solid place to lean my ladder, and I want you to help me out. I want you to come through for me. I want this to work. I, I, years from now, I want to be able to lean. I want it to, I want it to be secure. And God says through scripture and through wise people in fact there are people around you today who are older and wiser and been there and done that live life long enough to go i don't care how smart you are i don't care how careful you are i don't care how connected you are i don't care what you own who you know i i at some point in life you realize we live and it's the bad news before the good news we live in a hopelessly broken world and you can try and you can be careful, and you can plan, and you can invest well, and you can get a great education, but at some point in your life, you begin to recognize that nothing, no nothing, no nothing is secure in this world. And thus God says to you, and he says to me, hey, you gotta do all this stuff, but don't put your hope there. Now today, I want to take us through a few really confusing verses, okay? They're really, if you go like, whoa, that's confusing, it's not your problem. Paul just wrote in a confusing way. It's in the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 8, and the teacher side of me would like to pick through each of these verses, words, and all the Greek nuances because these passages are so rich, but we'd be here two and a half hours and you wouldn't know the point of the sermon by the time you woke up. So I don't want to do that. So for the next few minutes, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. If you brought a Bible, we'll put these verses on the screen. Um, Romans chapter 8, Paul explains where our hope should be, and this will come as no surprise. But more importantly for our discussion, Paul explains, this is so important, the futility for any of us to lean our ladder against our ability to control or predict the future. To lean our ladder against anything that has anything to do with the temporary nature of this world. And in making this case, it's a little bit negative, i got to warn you, but at the end he comes back around and he says, this is why it's so important for you and for me to begin to put our hope in the Lord. Our hope in the Lord, our hope in the Lord. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin verse 20. I'm going to tell you what verse 20 means before I let you look at it. And if, if you think, Andy, that was confusing, or I think you skipped some parts, I'm going to skip through these verses. I'm telling you that up front. If you get frustrated or mad, that's good. Go home. I dare you to get your Bible out and read it for yourself. That's always a win. Even if it's to prove me wrong, just go ahead. In fact, tomorrow morning, 
it, for those of you that read your Bibles in the morning or have been thinking about you how to do that, start with Romans 8, verse 20, and read back through these verses on your own and fill in the gaps where I skip some verses because this is so rich, and I mean it is so relevant to where we are today as a culture and where, what's going on in our world. Okay, here's what he says in, in verse 20, then we'll look at it together. In Romans 8, 20, he says, he says here's the deal. He goes back and he draws on an event in the book of Genesis that's typically referred to as the fall of man. It's the story about when sin entered the world. Now, you may not believe in sin, that's fine, but you do know bad things happen in the world. So we're together on that. And when we think about sin, um, we think usually think about an incident, like that was sinful. Or if you're in my business, it's so funny, often people say, Andy, do you think such and such is a sin? And do you think this is a sin? And basically they're saying, is it okay if I do that? Well, they don't say that. So do you think this is a sin? Because we think of sin as something you do and it's an incident. The Bible views sin as a disease that's toxic and fatal. And the Bible teaches that when sin entered the world, it entered the world as a fatal disease that impacted everything. Relationships, Creation, the relationship between people and creation, the animal kingdom, the weather, everything. That everything in the world was impacted by sin. It's a disease that has infiltrated the entire creation and that it's fatal, which means, according to Genesis, everything living eventually dies. Have you noticed that? Everything living eventually dies. You say, well, that's just the circle of life. I saw the movie, you know, I, you know, Lion King, you know, it figures that whole thing out. That's, that's a view. But Genesis, the scripture teaches, Jesus affirmed, Paul, you know, talks about that the reason everything in the world dies is because sin has polluted and corrupted everything. That is the basis for his argument that this is always a bad decision to put your hope in things that pertain to this world. Okay, that's what he means. Now let me read the verse and we're going to jump through these verses. Uh, Beginning in verse 20. He says, For the creation was subjected to frustration. Whenever you're frustrated, it's because of sin. Did you know that? The reason your experience in this world can be so frustrating Why won't those kids? Why won't my mama? Why won't my boss? Why can't people see the world the way I see it? Why won't people give me a chance? Why won't they call me back? I'm so frustrated. Paul says, welcome to the world. That God, because sin entered the world, God has made the decision. And I'm telling you, if you'll remember this, this will help you understand your experience in life. God has allowed sin to run its course. When sin entered the world, God said, I'm going to let it go like a wave. It's going to touch everything. It's going to impact everything. It's going to corrupt everything. Paul says that creation was subjected to frustration, that sin is going to run its course in the world. Middle of verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration in hope, there's our word, that the creation itself will be, future tense, liberated from its, look at this phrase, bondage to decay. That means everything in this world is decaying. You know that to be the case. You reach a certain age, every time you look in the mirror, you go, oh, what's that? That's the bondage to decay. That's what that is. You go, something's wrong with me. Nope, it's bondage to decay. And now, it is kind of funny, and it's not very encouraging, but this is, this is the case he's building. Everything is decaying, including your relationships, including your wealth. Everything ultimately has the ring and the smell of decay. Now, because we're Americans, we're thinking, by golly, I'm not going to decay. Man, I got surgery, and I'm going to get educated, and I, you know, I got good genes, and you know, my, you know, people think I look young for my age, and you know, I'm going to study hard, and I'm going to be careful. And as my son said the other day, Dad, I'm not going to get old. I said, I know, I used to say the same thing, but, and that's good. You work at it, buddy, and you, honestly, and you defend yourself against it, and you take vitamins, and you eat what your mama says, and don't eat what daddy says, and you know, you do, come on, you work hard against it, but at the end of the day, we are in bondage to decay. This is amazing. In 1997, Mother Teresa died. What? Mother Teresa? She can't die. Look at all the good she did. And as much good as she did in the world, do you know what happened to her body? 
her holy, amazing, intimidatingly pure and awesome body that, you know, housed this amazing brain and compassion for people, it died. Hey, if Mother Teresa couldn't beat the odds, if she couldn't find a way around, if she couldn't win, if she couldn't talk God out of it, if she couldn't beat the system, I got some bad news for you and some bad news for me, okay? <laughs> Ronald Reagan died. What? How could that? I mean, just, okay, you know, pick somebody on your side of the aisle. Just pick your most, <laughs> just pick your, the most famous, you know, person that you just think, they shouldn't die. They should get a pass. They've been so good. They've accomplished so much good that the world was better because they were born. And God says, and Paul says, and you know from experience, you know what? We live in a world that is in bondage. It's in bondage to decay. And God is going to let sin run its course. And it touches everything. It touches everything. Thing. There aren't many, and they lived happily forever. You know why? Because, and it's so hard, this is so hard for me as a pastor and with friends and stage of life, and you've seen this. Maybe you've had grandparents. They just had the most awesome marriage. They've been married for 50, 60 years, or you knew somebody's grandparents, or maybe your parents, and they held hands, and they still kissed and sat in the park and had birthday parties and talked about sex, and it was kind of weird, but, you know, you, they, were just, <laughs> they were just so in love, you know? I mean, they just did it all right, but it ended terribly because one of them got sick and one of them had those just horrible disease where relationally things went crazy and now you're managing your aging parents, your aging grandparents, and you look and you think they live such a charmed life. Why, why does it have to end this way? Newsflash, because when sin entered the world, it messed up every single thing it touches every single thing we live in the world of decay you say Andy I hope this is going somewhere happy we're going to get to happy in just a minute but here's the thing here's the thing listen listen the reason we lean our ladder up against the wrong wall is because we don't really believe that we believe we can beat the odds we can believe we believe we can be careful enough slick enough cool enough after all we're going to figure it out and Paul is saying before I get to the good news you got to really embrace the bad news no you're not there is no way to beat the odds the creation which is all of us and everything is in bondage to decay and yes we have happy birthdays and yes we have great vacations and yes your engagement is awesome and your honeymoon was great and you're in a happy and you're happily married and there you had that first child and there are some highlights and there are some mountaintop experiences and I love the worship this morning and yeah there's fun and there's joy but the movement the momentum the ultimate is towards sin and toward decay and we are in bondage to that kind of frustration verse 22 he goes on I'm not going to read you this one verse 22 and 23 he says this this tension creates in us a longing for something better this tension creates in us the thought that there's got to be more this creation, this, this tension creates in us a desire to look beyond this life to say, is there a world where there is happily ever after? Is there a world where relationships stay good? Is there a world where people get along? And it forces us to look outside of this life. Verse 24, I'll read you this one. For in this hope, this hope that there's more to this life than this life, in this hope that one day, as he referred to earlier, that we won't always be in bondage to decay. For in this hope, we, he, now he's talking to Christians, we were saved. That when you became a Christian, you became linked to a bigger, better story with a much better ending. But it goes beyond this life. That's the hope we were saved to. Then in, in um, verse uh, 25, skip to verse 25. But, and this is, this is kind of the, the transition point in his argument. But if we hope for, that is, God, there's got to be something else. There's got to be something more. There's got to be a place where sin, sorrow, and death is erased. There's got to be a place where all the effects of sin are done away with. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, here it is, we wait for it. What's that word? Patiently. What, do you know what that means? That means we do not give up hope. But our hope is not in this world. And our hope can't 
be in this life because eventually that hope is always in some way, shape, or form disappointed because we live in a world that's in bondage to decay that's full of frustration. He says, Christian, there's hope. Christian, you have something to look forward to. Christian, you have something to wait for patiently. Then in verse 26 through 30, I'm going to skip these, verse 26 through 30, he says this, God understands your frustration, and God understands your disappointment, and God understands that your ladder falls every once in a while, and God understands that sense of, that sense of you know, you are so hurt and so disappointed, sometimes you just kind of groan on the inside, and he says that God so understands that, that his spirit prays for you and prays for you, and prays for me with words that can't even be uttered, with groanings. And if you've ever been in the pit of despair, if you've ever hit rock bottom in terms of hopelessness, you know what it's like to get on your face or to lay in bed and just moan because there's nothing that can be done. And God says, I understand that. I understand the pointlessness that this world seems to offer sometimes. I understand that sense of isolation. I understand that. And then he turns a corner, verse, skipping down to verse 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? And check this out. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. What do you mean God is for us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? The point being, as God becomes the focus of your hope, as you center your expectations in the love of your heavenly Father, he says that is where hope does not, does not, does not disappoint. Verse, skip down to verse 38, big ending. If there was like, if there was a soundtrack with this, the music would be building big, big, big time right here. Check this out. For I am convinced, he says. Now, this is Paul who's been, you know, stoned, like with stones. He's been in prison. He's been left for dead. He's been shipwrecked three times. He's been beaten. I mean, this is the guy that has experienced the worst that the first century had to offer as a Christian. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else, which I can fill in the blank, neither divorce, abandonment, isolation, job loss, when am I going to retire, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the, what's that word? Come on, what's the word? From the love of who? Of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, you want to put your hope in something secure? You want to put your hope in something that won't disappoint? You want to put your hope in something that you can go to every single time? He says, you got to move your ladder. And I don't care how educated you are and your family. I mean, all that's great. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you want hope that remains hopeful, if you want to maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world, He says, you have got to move your ladder and lean it against your heavenly Father. For only there will you find enduring hope. Now, what does that mean in the meantime? It means that, yeah, you do your best. It it means that you live out, if I can say it this way, you live out kingdom values in a world where there aren't a lot of happy, happy, happily ever afters, where there's not necessarily a lot of happy endings. It means that you love like crazy, but when you don't get loved back, you don't lose hope because your hope wasn't here to begin with. It means you serve like crazy, and when no one serves you back, you don't lose hope because your hope wasn't here to begin with. It means you forgive like crazy, and when people don't forgive you back or you don't get the benefit of forgiveness, you don't lose hope because you never placed your hope there anyway. Do you plan? Of course you plan. Do you have ambition? Of course you have ambition. Do you leverage your talents and your skills? Of course you leverage your talents and your skills. Do you build things? Do you pursue progress? Do you save? Do you love? Do you engage culture? Do you engage the world? Yes, you do all of that. But do you place your hope in your hard work? 
Do you place your hope in the, the benefits of your ambition and your discipline? Do you place your hope in your education? Do you place your hope in all of the th- those things? He says, no. He says, like Jesus, like the Apostle Paul, like Mother Teresa, like your mama, like your grandmama, you live life as if that this is all there is and you love people like crazy and you do your best and you use your God-given talents and skills to accomplish everything you can. But at the end of the day, you say, in spite of all that and along with all that, my hope is in my Heavenly Father. That's where I've leaned my ladder. That's where I've placed my hope. It means you go to bed at night and you say, God, thank you for this awesome day. It all went perfect, wrinkle-free, didn't even get any birdie doo-doo on my car. I mean, it was like the perfect day, but God, still, my hope is in you. And you go to bed at night and you say, God, this was a terrible day and nobody called me back and I'm still as jobless as I was yesterday and I see no prospects and I'm so disappointed, but my hope, is in you. I have placed my hope in your love for me. This is what I wrote in my notes. When we loosen our grip from around our plans, our treasure, and our ambition, our pleasure, our plans, our treasure, and our ambition loosen their grip from around our hearts. And when they loosen their grips from around our hearts, I'm able, we're able to move our ladder because when I loosen my hands from around all these things that I've placed my hope in only then then am I able to transfer my hope to the only person the only thing that can sustain my hope through good and difficult times may your unfailing love unfailing love demonstrated when Christ died on the cross for our sin may your unfailing not going anywhere not going to budge always going to be their love may your unfailing love be with us Lord even as we move our ladder and place our trust in you here's the deal whatever it is you are have placed your hope in whatever it is you place your hope in will determine whether you're able to remain hopeful in a world where things are hopelessly broken. So where are you leaning your ladder? Where where have you placed your hope? What are you hoping for? I'm not saying you don't have plans. I'm not saying you don't have dreams. I'm not saying you don't follow through and do your best. Where is your hope? When you lay in bed at night and all is said and done and the music's off and you're staring up in the ceiling, where is your hope? What are, where have you Where have you centered your expectations? And if they are anywhere other than in your relationship or God's love for you, it is misplaced hope. It is hope that eventually, in some way, will disappoint you. Because although we don't like to think about it, we live in a hopelessly broken world. And we are the best at putting off the consequences of that. But eventually, eventually, these walls always, always, always crumble. The only way to maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world is to place your hope in the unfailing love of God for you. The only way to maintain hope long term is to move your ladder and to place your hope in the unfailing love of God for you. Love not demonstrated because somebody called you back and you got a date. Love not demonstrated in the fact that things went your way and you got the scholarship. Love not demonstrated in the fact that your wife came home and said, Honey, I realize you've been right the whole time. All 20 years you've been right and I'm taking full responsibility. Not that kind of hope. He says, Only when you place your hope in the unfailing love of God, demonstrated in one place and one specific moment in history, when Jesus Christ allowed himself to be crucified for your sins, which potentially sealed your eternity forever and locked you into a relationship with God that Paul says cannot be broken regardless of the economy, regardless of what you do, regardless of what other people do to you. The only way, the only way, to maintain hope 
in a hopelessly broken world is by placing your hope in the unfailing love of God. And it's my prayer for you and for all of us as we continue to face uncertain times in an uncertain economy. I, my prayer is for me and for my family and for my kids and for all of us that as the walls start shaking and as the ladder starts shaking, we would be reminded that we weren't supposed to put our hope here anyway. And hopefully things get better. And hopefully things turn around. And hopefully we'll be a part of the solution. But in spite of what happens here, our hope can remain strong because we have been invited to place our hope in God's unfailing love for us. That's how you remain hopeful in a world that is, in fact, hopelessly, hopelessly broken. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, that's much easier for me to talk about than for us to walk out of here and do. And Father, I pray for the man or the woman who maybe this week, maybe this morning, maybe this afternoon, received news that uh, reflected the fact that their ladder is falling fast, that the wall against which they've leaned their ladder of hope is no more. Whether it's a marriage, a relationship, an engagement, a scholarship, an opportunity, a job that was promised that's now been taken away, whatever it is, Father, I pray that in this moment of free fall, in this season of free fall, that they would find the courage to place their hope in you and that they would find joy and they would find peace, and they would find uh, the opportunity to put behind them their anxiety and to trust in you because your unfailing love has been established. It's been proven. Your unfailing love is for us, that is for us every single day. And that they would find the joy that comes with knowing that you love them unconditionally. And that all this is is a transition and an opportunity to reaffirm your love for them. Father, I pray for the single or the college student or the high school student, and they've yet to have to manage one of these tensions. And like all of us, there are ladders leaning against all the wrong things. Not intentionally, it's just the way we grew up. I, Father, I pray that they would be able to avoid the heartache that comes with hopelessness and helplessness. And that somehow, even in their, because they begin their journey with you and begin their journey of faith, that they would move their ladder and that the theme of their life would be that God is my hope. God is my hope. God, my heavenly Father, is my hope. Father, you're un even, even as you shower over us your unfailing love, we choose, we choose to place our hope in you. Please give each of us the wisdom to know what to do with this simple message and then the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.